So Bill English, thank you so much for sitting down with the IPA and, uh, and, and, and giving us some of your time today. Um, the first thing I want to ask is, you were the Finance Minister in and then the Prime Minister of uh, probably the most successful uh, centre-right government in living memory. And I think the part of that success is the fact that the key in English governments demonstrated that good, uh, good economic policy does not come at, come at the expense of good social policy and good social outcomes, that the two are actually complementary. Uh, what do you put that down to? Well, you're quite, you're quite right. The two uh, do go together. Uh, and I think in the government of which I was a part, uh, we had quite a strong focus on how they were connected uh, and on maintaining a broad range of support. You know, often centre-right governments assume that their voters and other voters aren't that interested in what happens with social policy, but we found that uh, almost everyone's concerned about how a government deals with its toughest issues and the most challenging individuals and families uh, in their community. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2015 you have made a speech here in, in Melbourne uh, and one line that caught my attention was that when you said, sometimes I wonder if the post-war welfare state has set up, was set up to service misery uh, rather than reduce it. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, if you look at how the, the, the incentives on the people who actually operate the machine, yeah. uh, they are gen very, very often quite well-intentioned people. Uh, but it's not a machine that, um, that benefits from there being less to do. Yeah. So the traditional cycle in social policy is that uh, there's a problem, programs are announced, money, more money gets spent, yeah doesn't solve the problem, uh, so you go through the cycle again. Mm. The problem's even, even bigger or at least persistent, so more resource is applied. And it's a bit of a backwards way of thinking about it, isn't it? So mm. if you've got all misery in your community, people want that fixed, if at all possible. We want the best for our fellow citizens. Mm. Uh, then we tend to reward uh, the organisations uh, where the problems don't get resolved mm. because not fixing it gets more resource, more growth, more jobs, mm. more spending. So <coughs> we spend a bit of time trying to rethink mm. uh, what the welfare state focuses on. And actually it should be focusing on reducing the misery, particularly for those people uh, who are most disadvantaged. We talk a lot here at the IPA about the dignity of work and the importance of work, not just for its economic benefits and its, its benefits to the economy as a whole, but the importance of work in itself for individual people uh, and the importance of getting people into work on a social and a moral level. Uh, what does that mean to you as somebody who, I suppose, uh, got a record number of New Zealanders off welfare? I think you cut welfare numbers there by about a third over, over the, the lifetime of the key and English governments. Well, it was significant. Uh, bear in mind it was in the context of a significant recession in 2019 uh, and then an economy that grew uh, pretty steadily uh, and at times pretty strongly through a period of seven or eight, nine years. Uh, so, you know, the economic um, environment was good for getting people off welfare. But I think the real, the real challenge is with those groups uh, who have still no connection with work whatsoever, mm. even in um, strong economies such as Australia's had now for 25 years, mm. uh, you'd think that someone, you'd think that everyone would have had a crack at a job by now in Australia, uh, but it hasn't actually happened. And I think I've come to the conclusion that a lot of the way government interacts with uh, people with no or very loose connection to work uh, makes it harder for them. So, for instance, we put people on disability pensions yeah. and then pay no attention to them. Yeah. Well, as the months go by, yeah, sit and forget, as the months go by, they lose their social capacities, mm. their connections, their motivation. Uh, that's all utterly predictable, but the welfare states let that happen for 30 years. Uh, or other groups who are right out on the edge of the system, they avoid all government services, are deeply mistrustful of them mm. for good reason. Um, they're angry and dissociated. And that's because they get, uh, one of the reasons at least, is because when government interacts with them, it does it in a way that undermines what small social capital or personal resilience they might have. Mm. And so uh, I think there's ways that government can get a much better understanding of those groups of people that it's mm. traditionally left on the sideline and can get much more active about what it does with them.
So one ethic that the key and English governments brought to uh, being in government was the idea of social investment uh, as a me mechanism for social policy. Can you talk me through a bit about what that involves and how that diff differs from uh, welfare policy as we, we know it currently? Well, it's a, it's a toolkit for government just making much better decisions that are relevant mm. to the people it, it, it uh, pretends to support. Uh, and that means using um, toolkit that's much more readily available now. So uh, data and data analytics can give you fantastic insights now mm. um, using longitudinal models like, the, like actuaries use for insurance. Uh, enables you to see what happens to people over a lifetime. So someone can look uh, like they're pretty low cost, you know, a young person on an unemployment benefit mm. or on a disability benefit at the age of 21, uh, they don't look, uh, this, this year you just pay them that benefit and uh, not much else happens. Mm. But actually they could be there for 40 years. Mm. And, act and you can get a pretty clear picture of what makes it more likely that they'll stay for 40 years. Mm. And the principle of social investment says, well, let's do something about it now. Or, and let's do more about it now. Um, or, the, or with our highest risk children, mm. um, who in our world cost a million dollars before they're age 35. Million dollar kids. Million dollar kids. Yeah. And it's not the million dollars is it, that's the problem, it's the misery it's the that, that represents. Potential. The waste of potential. Yeah. When you know that, uh, it creates a lot more motivation to deal with what's actually quite a small number of children in our community and do it properly, you know, deal with their real health problems, uh, put quite a bit more resource into getting them permanent homes uh, where they're going to be loved and cared for. Um, these are all things people want, but the toolkit, the traditional state um, social services toolkit has been too limited to make a difference for the hard cases. It's been a case, I suppose, of continuing to support people who've fallen through the cracks but no mechanism to intervene early and to, to uh, li get, lift them out of poverty that, uh, that, 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 that is self-perpetuating. Self that's right, that, that, that's right. Yeah. and uh, what the social investment toolkit shows you is that for, some, for a small number of people you need a lot more resource, mm. um, for a, quite a number of people the gov governments are doing things that simply don't work, they mm. just don't have an impact. And unfortunately, for some governments, uh, government services are making them are making them worse. Uh, so they end up people end up living quite chaotic, crisis-driven lives. They're trying to find their way around a system that was never designed for them. That was mm. designed for people with much more orderly lives and with mm. much more resource. And it's it's no wonder that they that they can persistently fail. On the other hand, there's also very little understanding of those who have the resilience to get through all that. Uh, we found with our highest risk young people, um, the, like you're talking about 1% of your population, uh, two or three out of 10 of them were getting the school leaving um, certification, mm. which enabled them to go on to further training. Now, no one's ever asked how that happens. <laughs> and we need to know because yeah. those are lives of uh, dignity and yeah. hope and aspiration where despite huge challenges, these young people have been able to realise it. You won't find that written about no. in any policy handbook, any university course, uh, any official bureaucratic papers. Mm. No one knows. Well, we should find out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just finally, uh, on sort of a broader political question, uh, the national government uh, did reforms that uh, makes me as an Australian my eyes water, uh, whether it be reducing the top marginal rate of tax to 33%, whether it be reducing company tax and broadening the GST to fund that, uh, whether it be uh, consolidating and, and yes, reducing welfare benefits, uh, whether it be uh, selling down the government's stake in state-owned enterprises, including Air New Zealand. Uh, those reforms were not always popular in New Zealand, but they were accepted by the community. Uh, and the government succeeded in making the case for them. Uh, what advice would you give Australian policymakers whose track record recently of economic reform has been, uh, to put it mildly, a little bit underwhelming? Well, look, there's one critical difference uh, which I think helps explain a lot of this. In New Zealand, we had decisive events in 2008 to 10, so yeah. we got into a significant recession. And then we had a major earthquake in our second biggest city, uh, which has ended That's up right. costing 20% of GDP to fix. 
So no one could argue there wasn't a reason to do some things differently. Mm. I think that was a critical factor. Uh, we also had um, some very effective political leadership and John Key you know, elected with a strong mandate, a very settled party uh, and some real skills and a good team around him and I was fortunate, good finance to, be, minister. I was fortunate to be part of that team. <laughs> Uh, and I think another thing was often just taking the, you know, being quite open with the public about the, the changes that you're making. Uh, and that actually happens here when you see the arguments about trying to get various tax reforms through the Senate. Mm. That does bring up all the issues. People get plenty of time to debate them. Mm. And that is the right kind of process if you can get agreement, of course. Mm. Uh, and we, we didn't have as comp the complexity of the Senate. Uh, if you can get agreement, then people know all the arguments have been had and got yeah. there. So we re tried to run very transparent, um, open policy processes so people could follow the logic. I'm a great believer in that. The public are quite capable of following the logic, sometimes are quite complex arguments, but you have to understand it yourself. Yeah. And then and you have to be willing to lay it out. And that's not always easy because you can get a blowback that can easily um, unsettle uh, mm. politicians. So you've got to look at a more complex environment here. And of course, you've had so much success for so long. Yeah. And New Zealand uh, has always, you know, always sees Australia as a benchmark. There's a it's the other way around these days, I can assure you. Yeah, well, there's still, a, there's still a gap, pay gap. You can earn more for the same job here than you can in New Zealand. And we admire that success. Mm. And whatever the political comings and goings, the Australian economy and success, success seems to just keep continuing. Well, let's, uh, let's hope so. But Sir Bill, thank you so much for your time and uh, thanks for coming in and uh, having a chat. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.